Hello and welcome along to the Rugby Pod Big Gym and Goody are here as usual and we're brought to you this week by Beer 52. It's been awards season at Beer 52 HQ in November so they've been sending out a case of their highest rated beers from the last 12 months as voted by their 150,000 members so really it's the best of the best and if you've been on the fence about trying it if you've been on the fence about trying it, now is the time. Each of the eight beers comes with an award-winning beer magazine and some snacks. There's no minimum commitment, so you can just take the free case, try the beers and see what you think. And if it's not for you, you can pause or cancel at any point. All you need to do is go to beer52.com forward slash rugby and cover the postage. That's the word beer followed by the number 52.com forward slash rugby and get your first case of eight beers for free and you'll be supporting the rugby pod as well. You've always been taking your beer 52, tucking into it? Mate, I had to have more than eight this weekend. Watching that Ruggers, I had like six cases. It was just our. So the beer 52 beers have cheered me up because it makes you merry and happy, right, Jim? Very right, very right. And because we are getting into the festive part of the calendar, can you believe we're in December? It's absolutely ridiculous. Well, we're not. We're on the 30th of November. It'll be December 1st when the podcast goes out. If... We carry on in the vein in which we're going, which is the millions of misses. If we keep going in the same vein that we're going and the millions and millions of listeners just keep coming back and flooding back into the new year, I'm going to approach Beer 52 and ask them if they'll do a Big Jim's beer, Big Jim's bottle of beer, Big Jim's can. Imagine drinking yourself. Not, 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 oh, not well, be careful what you're saying there. Responsibly. <laughs> Respons- oh, gosh. <laughs> Recycling yourself. <laughs> Surely. Well, someone else can drink me then. Someone else can drink a can of Big Jim or a bottle of Big Jim or Big Goody or Andy Good or whatever you want to call it. What would you like this like? Mine would taste sweet. Uh, it would have lots of calories. Ginger. In. Ginger. It would have lots of <laughs> calories in it. It'd be, um, yeah. Uh, mate, what a statement there. Imagine drinking yourself. Jim, have a word with yourself, pal. Well, there's one when you talk about the ingredients. What, what would yours taste like? Go on, Goody, finish off what it'd be, because I think it would be ginger. It'd be sp- spiky Where, if that's the flavour. Where's the ginger coming from? My hair is brown now. But you're not going to have hair in it, are you? It's just you're going to put a bit of ginger in your beer. Ginger beer. Oh, ginger I reckon, beer. G- I reckon Goody's beer, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. It's, that, that, that's, that's true. I do. Uh, I just, I'm just, it'll be honest. It'll be an honest beer. I will tell you that. It'll it might, be an honest. <laughs> it will be honest. <laughs> it might. It might piss a few people off, but a lot of other people will just be nodding, going, "Yeah, that is an honest beer." Honest but bitter. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> Here's one. I don't even know. Actually, we're, we're delving oh, into something bitter. complete, completely. Oh, no, I ain't bitter. No, no, your beer can would be bitter. Can you say that you, back? No, your beer would be bitter. No, I'm not. No, I'm, your beer would be bitter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my beer would be lean, legendary, crisp. Sharp, edgy, funky. And full of bollocks. Did I say legendary or not? And full of absolute bollocks as well. (laughs) (laughs) I think my beer will be a bit boring. How's your week been, boys? You know what? Something spiked my adrenaline yesterday. And again, you you don't know whether you want to share everything on the rugby pod. But we do. We share absolutely everything and more. So, clearly, we're in a tough time here. We spoke about my time last week at the minute. Bit edgy, right? Bit edgy. So I thought I need to get some jobs done. Had some stuff to take back to the shop, right? So I went to Evan Cycles because I'm an avid cyclist now. I look, I look absolutely horrendous on a bike. Goody, actually, you might look better than me on a bike. I look no, I, I can promise you I don't. I can okay. promise you I don't. Fine, I'll take that then. I'll take that. But <laughs> because I've become so good on the bike, I've had to get the gear. So Goody's gone all the gear, no idea. I've just gone straight gear, out there doing my thing, out on the mountain bike, out on the road bike, and just getting out there and getting after it. Now, I need some gear because it's getting cold. So I've gone to Evan Cycles. I'm calling these shit houses out because this is how bad they were. I'm going to get to the, st- get to the point here. So I went in the shop, and because of the stature and the figure and the size of human being that I am, I'm basically the shape of an avatar, right? So you don't get your stereotypical clothes fitting you, especially cycling gear. I'm six, foot nine, I'm six foot nine with heels. And you've walked in and someone's gone, who's the freak? Who's the freak? As I'm taking off my shirt in the shop to put on one of the cycling <laughs> jerseys. And they're like, <laughs> is this the rock? Is this the rock? No, it's just Jim Hamilton, former Scotland great. They're screaming, no, like they always put the panic alarms on. No, 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 no. 
I'm like, what's going on here? I've got my shirt off and my muffin top's hanging over the top. And <laughs> I'm thinking, what's going on here? They said, you can't try it on. You can't try it on. COVID, COVID, you can't try it on. I'm okay. 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 Calm down. I said, well, can I, like, can I take it home? If it don't fit, it probably won't fit. Can I bring it back? They're like, yeah. So this was like earlier in the week. Later in the week, I've gone back and said, I don't fit. They said, oh, have you got the receipt? I'm like, I've got four kids. No. <laughs> then the guy said to me, well, what have the kids got to do with it? I was like, well, I haven't got the receipt, but you were here when I bought the shirt last week, told me to go home. You were the guy who told me to go home, try it on. If it doesn't fit, bring it back. So I'm here. I brought it back. It's got the tags on. You can see it's not been worn. It's in your green Evans bag. And he said, I can't do anything without the receipt. I was like, I'll tell you what, well, don't worry. I said, all right. I said, forget it. I said, instead of giving me my money back, just give me a credit note because I'll, I'll buy some cycling shorts that I'll look incredible in or whatever. <laughs> you're, actually, are you actually talking like this, saying I'll look incredible in it as you're speaking to the bloke? I, I might have said it out loud a couple of times. I don't really know. <laughs> but Phoebe's with me. So I've got Phoebe, my seven-year-old daughter, watching her dad, you know, just basically not blowing money left, right and centre. If something don't fit, take it back, right? Take it back, get your money back and, and get the next size up. Obviously, there's not an exercise. Anyway, the guy said to me, look, I can't do anything without receipt. I'm thinking, well, this is ridiculous. So I said, <laughs> can I speak to your manager? He said, I'll go and see if he's in. Goes out the back. True story, this. Goes out the back. Comes back. He said, oh, he's just on his break. He's just having a coffee break. I was like, okay. I said, right, I'll wait in the shop then. He said, oh, no, you can't wait in the shop. You need to wait outside COVID. I was like, right, I'll go and wait outside. 15, 20 minutes has gone by. I've gone back in. And I said to the guy, can you speak to the manager, please? I, I want to find out what's happening. He said, I've just, I spoke to him about 10 minutes ago, he said that he won't give you your money back. I'm like, what? I said, I've just been stood outside, mate, for 15, 20 minutes. Like, <laughs> you, you could have come and told me. Can I speak to your manager? Next thing, the manager of Evans, Evans, Evans Cycles, walks, waddles out, doesn't even look at me, waddles out, he's like, oh, problem, sir, problem? I was like, you got the sir bit right. I was like, but the way that you're speaking to me, first and foremost, is unacceptable. I've got Phoebe there. And she's freaking out because, you know, dad's turned into an alpha, alpha male. And he's pointing to the side of the till that you can't see. He's like, did you, did you not see that when you walked to the till last week? I said, did I not see what? He said, big sign saying you need your receipts. I'm like, it's on the side of the till, mate. And, he's, and then he starts asking me. He's, he's asking me to go back a few days and ask me which way I walked to the till. Next thing, mate. Have you ever had this before, lads, where... You wanted to throw another human being through a wall. Have you ever had that or not? <laughs> yes, many times, James. You have? Okay. So <laughs> it, I've just saw me, myself, and Irene. <laughs> He's speaking to me in a manner in which you do not speak to a man in front of his seven-year-old daughter. But what do you do? What do you drop, do? Drop the head. Walk forward. You walk forward, but they've got the COVID screen, so you can only get so far. And Phoebe's like, Dad, Dad, don't worry about that. She won't really leave that bit out. And then the guy's like, well, I said, no, no, it's not well, nothing. I said, the way that you've spoken to me is not in a way in which I like my son. I said, it's completely unprofessional. And started, basically, I wanted to say to him, when was the last time you got on a bike? He was about 27. <laughs> but I couldn't because Phoebe was there. But um, the next thing I know, I'm having this altercation in Evan Cycles. And I genuinely was going through my mind thinking, I'm going to put this man through the wall in a minute. What's going to happen? Are the police going to come? Phoebe's here. What did I do, you asked me? Ask me. What did you do, Jim? I just walked out the shop. <laughs> With your tail between your legs? Raging. I've been raging ever since. So Evan Cycles in Edinburgh, I don't care. You could be an advert down the line probably if you want, because we've got loads. So you can, be, you can come on as well. <laughs> Disgraceful. That's the service. At what point? At what point? You, like, so if you didn't have your receipt, you were there in the shop with the same guy with the tags on, you can see the guy's six foot nine avatar with heels. It probably ain't going to fit him, but he needs to take it away so it fits. If he brings it back without the receipt, who has a receipt? Who has a paper receipt these days? Everyone, Jim. Genuinely? If you're going to take something back, yeah. Unless you've got. What, what about going onto your internet banking and having proof of purchase? Said that. Threw that at him. Nothing. Nothing. Wouldn't have it. No, needs a receipt. Needs a receipt. Oh dear. Oh dear. So I'm still raging.
still raging. I, I wish we could go Sam Owen on him and meet up down the park on a Sunday and sort it out like true men and cyclists. <laughs> but you can't say that now. Dear, oh dear, dear. And oh that, that was a highlight. I'd say that arguably that's the highlight of my year. Of your year or just a weekend? The year. If we look back over 2020, it would have been Hong Kong, but I'm going to say that was the highlight. That is what got the adrenaline flowing the most. Having a tear up, nearly having a tear up in my daughter. Evans. My daughter seeing me put a 20 stone man at Evans through a wall. That could have, that could have been it. That's how I saw it in my mind. <laughs> but Phoebe, your father's not aggressive. He's just going through a tough time right now. That's it. <laughs> dear, oh dear, oh dear. I just love it. Like I was going to have a proper moan today because of lockdown. Go on, go well, on. To, and you just put a smile on my face. So yesterday, we trying to entertain the twins, right? During lockdown, when everything's closed, swimming pools closed, all the kids' stuff that we're told to closed. They, the kids don't get it. So trying to entertain them and find things to do. I've looked out in the garden yesterday morning and there's leaves everywhere. And the gardener that we have, it comes every couple of weeks. He's, he's Portuguese. <laughs> he's Portuguese. He's gone back to Portugal for the lockdown. So I'm looking at it going, we're going to go out in the back garden today and we're going to clean up the leaves. And the girls can play. You know, kids like throwing leaves around and all that stuff. Nature. Yeah. So out we go. Have some breakfast. Get the coats on. I'm out there in shorts and T-shirt. I was going to say because I'm hard. Probably not. Probably because I'm just sweating the whole time anyway. Just walking up and down the stairs. So out there, shorts and T-shirt. I've got my rake out. And I've spent about half an hour trying to rake up some leaves. And I've done, in half an hour, I reckon I've done about 5% of the garden. I'm a back at this point. Is, we, know, we know you've got a big... He's, he's got 10 acres. That's what it's he's not, getting no, to. No, it's not that. No, no it's, of the estate. No, it's not that. I'm saying I've done, in half an hour, I've done 5% of the garden. My back is absolutely fucked. And me and manual labour just don't go hand in hand. Blisters on your hands? Yeah. <laughs> I've actually got a blister on my thumb right there uh, because of it. Anyway, so I'm sat there thinking, I can't do this. I've looked at the rest of the garden and thought, I ain't got this in me. As much as the girls are running around having fun, I haven't got the rest of the garden in me. So I said to the missus, I said, I'm, I'm waiting until the gardener comes back next week after lockdown. She's like, no, no, we've said to the girls, we'll collect them up, put them in a big pile, make a big den for the uh, hedgehogs that are coming to our garden so they can have somewhere to rest on. We know you live in the country. We know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm literally like, right, what can I do? So I said to the missus, I said, I'm going straight down to home base and I'm getting a proper fucking air blower. So I've driven down to home base and Jim's slagging off Evans. I'm going to, pat home base on the back because i've driven down there they've helped me out no end probably saw me coming and went what's the most expensive um leaf blower oh we've got this one for you sir double power you know big battery pack on it blah 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 and i'm, I'm having it i'm having that one i've taken it back to the garden it's taken me about half an hour to see the rest of it where it would have taken me about five hours so my back's still a bit sore this morning the kids weren't really that helpful they liked it for about five minutes and then i was just trying to blow them over with the uh, with the leaf blower and then they hated it and um, I just can't wait for lockdown to end so the gardener can come back. The nanny can come back. The chef can come back. Everyone just come back and help me. And for all the listeners out there, if you go into home base and you say the code RugbyPod85, <laughs> you'll, you'll get 85% off a leaf blower. <laughs> uh, good news with the fans uh, coming back, boys. We're going to have fans back in the stadiums. Well, some people are, aren't they? Some places, some clubs, um, some stadia are. Unfortunately, some aren't. And that, unfortunately, is the mighty Rico Arena. The Andy Good Suite is still staying closed. Because Coventry, as Jim knows, because of what we talked about last week, which is you know, very sad, but Coventry's fucked. It's in Tier 3. So they ain't got no fans. But there, a lot of other places have. So it's great to see because, I mean, rugby's, our shit's rugby with no fans when it's kicked. Fest, box kicks, no fans, terrible. So let's get the fans back. Do you think there's any solutions to make rugby look a little bit better at the moment? Well, me and Goody spoke about it last week. Probably a little bit different in terms of opinions, and this will probably come down to a forward and a back of how we see the game, how we enjoyed the game. But there's a part of me now, having watched the games at the weekend, where I'm more siding with Goody, but there's also an understanding watching the games and being perceived as an expert, having played the game as a professional was probably the, the better way to say it, is I understand why we're seeing more kicking. I heard Sam Underhill on the radio chatting about it and I thought his points were the exact points of what it is. Teams are so good now, right? 
Now you've got to find different ways in which to break down teams. And Goody will talk about it. I'm sure we can talk about it even more. Defences now are that good that it's actually more difficult to have the ball. Now, if you look at a couple of years gone by, and let's use Exeter as a really good example, right? So Exeter are a team that like to keep hold of the ball, okay? Around the halfway line. So if you, if you look at all rugby teams, your very best teams are teams that can manage what they do around the halfway line. And when I say that is, if you use the halfway line as the kind of barometer, you get teams that can play, 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 play. You've got a Bristol with semi round Radra who can make a line break, and all of a sudden you're into the opposition 22. Most teams now, with the defences that are out there, it will be a battle of that halfway line. So who can keep the ball the longest and therefore earn a penalty or get a line break, but the light who's get a penalty, kick to the corner, and when you're in the 22, you've got a real opportunity of scoring. Or if you've got a really good defence, and this comes on to the point that I want to make now, or the breakdown is being favoured for the defensive team, you've got more chance of getting a turnover then, and then you get the ball on halfway and kick down into the opposition. So now it's actually easier and becomes more of a 50-50 to kick the ball. And, and that's what we're seeing now. In my opinion, that's why we're seeing it. Because, again, to kind of summarise what I'm saying, defence is so good now is that most of them, at international level, if we, if we go away from Exeter, for example, and we look at the international teams, they're so good defensively. All teams across the board. Look at Georgia against Ireland. You know, and defensive... And listening to Jerry Flannery, I think, chat on comms, who's coaching Quinns as well, a lot of it is down to mindset and the physicality that you bring to it. So it's the easiest thing to kind of fix, really. And that's why Sean Edwards has such an effect on the teams that he coaches, Wales in years gone by and now France. So teams are now looking at a way to adapt what they're doing. New Zealand, best team in the world a few years ago for a number of years, had the highest number of kicks in games. Saracens, exactly the same. The box kicking that we saw, uh, the playing the percentages, low risk rugby, when you get in the, the, the opposition 22, take your chances. So teams want to win. It's about winning. And there's a fine line now between winning and playing this unbelievable brand of rugby where you play, 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 and you run it from anywhere. But mate, I do agree. And, you know, people talk about reducing the amount of subs. Um, you know, I know Nigel Owens was on rugby tonight, last night, which was Sunday night, talking about that. For me, the big one, and, you know, you're seeing line speed and you're seeing, you know, breakdown. Every player from 1 to 15 now is expected to be a bit of a jackaler around the breakdown. So it's not just your stereotypical back rowers dipping their head in, trying to get turnovers. You know, everyone has a, is coached, is trained, is, is expected to have a dig at a breakdown. So it makes it harder. And the amount of times you see him players bounce back to their feet. It's 15 defenders up on their feet and uh, the attack have got four bodies on the deck from the breakdown. So you, your number's down. But then the, the other big issue, and there was a big thing around it at the World Cup last year about refereeing the offsides. I still don't think referees are refereeing offsides because when you've got 15 bays on your feet and you're talking it up and you get energy from defence, you fly off the line. You can fly up collectively because you've got more defenders than attackers that everyone's just got line speed, haven't they? And I still think there's so many teams right on the edge of offside all the time. Whether that law needs to be tinkered with around, you need to see pure daylight between the back of a ruck. You need to see half a yard off the back or a specific uh, measurement. You watch games and, I don't know, it's the law book around what constitutes a ruck and where the offside line is in the ruck, whether it's the, the hindmost foot of the defensive team or... Uh, which could be halfway up a rock sometimes or whatever it is. Refs, I don't reckon, are refereeing offsides enough, which means attack have got so much less time on the ball. A 10, there was nothing worse. When Blitz Defence came in, I was a 10 years and years and years ago. When Blitz Defence first came in, you're like, what the fuck is this about here? You've got no time on the ball to tip make it, tip it. Just fucking lob it. Just either lob it over the top to the winger or boot it. And that's what, obviously, defences, when they started taking control, would do. And now every team does it. It comes up so hard, first five, six defenders. It puts the skill of the player under pressure. And ultimately, like you go back to watching games. We watched some games in Australia at the weekend. or Sorry, we watched a game in Australia at the weekend where the All Blacks absolutely dominated Argentina. The weather was perfect. We're now judging these games in cold, sometimes wet conditions at the minute because it's November. And that skill level is even harder to be able to go to play and get around 
uh, hard defensive line that's coming up, potentially offside, getting to the edge there to play, to put some shape on it, it's difficult under the conditions that we're seeing at the minute. And people say, oh, it shouldn't make a difference. Well, it does because that half a second you've got less now because all defences are getting off the line really quickly. And the majority of time, the defence has got more numbers than the attack. It means that you just go to a crash bash, you know, try and win the game line and it's, it becomes dull and then you just kick it. So I think there's a massive onus on the referees on policing and the assistant referees policing the offside line and pinging teams that are right on the if you're on the edge it's got to be a penalty because then you need to find a way of slowing down legally slowing down a defensive line because they're just flying up all over the shop at the minute and attack are under so much more pressure their skill sets are under more pressure which means you just go to what's the a low percentage play that is low risk but won't get our team into trouble but might put pressure on the opposition is the box kick game and that's all that happens in the midfield and it become it's become dull it really has and you know it then becomes a battle of power the other thing and i've probably waffled on a fair bit i think the other thing nigel owens mentioned it is reducing subs you know you've got these ridiculous athletes look at props now the majority of props look like absolute athletes um you know what's his name at Bristol? max laheef takes his top off he's ripped to the hills and back and he's an athlete that can, you know, these they're all athletes now. So there's no fatigue being built up. And then you bring on another load of identical athletes at 60, 50 minutes. And they're primed to go for half an hour, full ball. So there's no fatigue built up anywhere either, I think. Um, so reducing subs is an idea as well. But I, I certainly think referees can take more control of offside lines and trying to prevent teams from getting off the line, giving the attack a bit more time. And when you talk about referees, oh, my Roman Platt. This was going to be my point, Goody. Can I, can, can I talk a little bit about him and where the questions come through and a lot of people are talking about it? Mine stem from Roman Platt from the weekend. I thought he was shot. No, 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 no. Genuinely, I thought you look at the standard of players on show, we talk about the physicality, we can maybe talk about some law changes which we think might help. But ultimately, if you've got a referee that isn't refereeing the game to the standard which it needs to be refed at, it's going to be a difficult one to talk about. We can talk about um, the, the high tackle from Elliot Daly and taking Bigger out in the air as well. The big, the big one for me is around the scrum because the scrum saps the energy out of the spectators. That's what I think in the reset. Now, I'm watching the game unfold and he is making the wrong, wrong calls at the scrum, Roman Poise. What spectators are you talking about, by the way? Uh, the people watching it on TV, okay. anywhere. All the no five, fans. There's no there's fans. There's no fans. All the five people watching it at home. Sorry, all the five people watching it at the stadium. But I'm watching the scrums, and I'm not a scrum expert, but I understand the scrums. I understand when there needs to be a reset. You can see when a player or a prop slipped. You can see when players are trying to cheat, which they don't do anymore because the players want it in and out, mainly. You'll get a dominant scrum who want to keep it in. It's very rare now that scrums just get pulled down or there's a manipulation around there. The players want the game to, to move forward. I'm watching him referee the scrum. It was nothing, nothing worse than shocking when I'm watching it. So that's, that's one thing that we can talk about, what happens with all these scrum resets. Um, and then that probably brings me up to the point where I'm going to talk about the five-second rule around the, the, the long rucks and the box kicks. There ain't five seconds. You, can't, you, can, you can have a crack about it. It's 10, 10 seconds, 15, 20, 25. Now, if they do take longer than you're, five seconds... You're, go good at math. you're good at maths, mate. You've just gone up in fives then. Well, that, well exactly. You can, you can do it in, in, in 50s. It doesn't really matter the ball's in there that long. <laughs> but what I'm saying, so if, if the referee does call that it's, it's too long, what do they say? They, they go back and say, right, it's a free kick. And then what do, what do most teams do with a free kick? Oof it. Scrum. Or they do put a bomb up, depends where it is. No, no, so, sorry. If, if you're box kicking out of your kind of 10, 10 metres out from the try line and you're longer than five seconds, we've maybe seen three or four in the last month. The referee says, use it. If you don't use it, it's going to be a free kick. Most teams will then go for a scrum, OK? I think what I've really enjoyed about Exeter starting the trend is a tap and go. Tap Just and go. go. So I think that's one thing they need to take out. If there's a free kick, forget the scrum. Tap and go, big fella. That's the, do you know what I mean? Tap and go, or if it's, if it's defensively, give them a long arm, give them a penalty. My other argument with the scrum, and I understand that, Jim, and, and I completely agree with a lot of it, 
my only thing with the scrum and as a back my perspective on that is it is the best time if you can just have a solid platform you've got eight players tied up from each team so you've got more space than you when you're attacking against a solid defensive line that are just flying off the line so i used to love scrums and trying to formulate an attack to break down and manipulate a defense because effectively a lot of the time you can have you, you can have all seven backs in a backs move from a left hand side scrum coming up against four four and a half defenders and that's where a back should get excited but we're not being able to see that because scrums just aren't being completed um you know it's then going to a free kick and then you know resets and you're right referees like Roman Poit just do not have a clue and and I'm, saying, a, I'm saying that and I'm saying that as an Englishman who you know we got 95 percent of the decisions going our way at the weekend imagine being Welsh and watching Roman Poit win that uh, sorry imagine being Welsh and watching Roman Poit referee that game I'm not taking anything away from England we thoroughly deserve to win and it wouldn't have changed anything but he was brutal. But you can't say anything, can you, from a Welsh perspective, because it looks like it's sour grapes. I know that Wayne Pivak's come out and mentioned the scrum, but I'm watching it and I'm thinking, mate, we're talking about two of the best teams in the world playing rugby here, and your TMO's calling in something, and people are moaning about the TMO. I think the TMOs are great when they, they call in instances off the ball and stuff that the referee misses, because you're going to miss a load of stuff because of the amount of stuff that's going on. So as the referee especially if it's foul play, it's not no, no, no. It's got, okay, you've put the TMO's picked up. He's probably watched it five times before he's called it in. And he said, yeah. he's like, no, no, no. I know, no. Do you know what, do you know what Roman Poit actually said? And I think I heard it right. When the TMO had buzzed into him to say about Bigger being taken out in the air. He said, no, no, he jumped into him. He's basically trying to blame Bigger for jumping in to Sam Underhill in the air. I'm like, what are you on about, Roman? You absolute, yeah, cowboy. It just shock him. So in summary, there's two things in there, isn't it? So we spoke about the need for the scrum to speed up because it's genuinely, I'd hate to be a, uh, genuinely, I'd hate to be a scrum coach because what's the point? You're scrummaging, you know, Samson Lee, like, he walked off, he's like, what can you do? There's nothing he could have done differently in that game. And he's been pulled off because Reese Carey the week before. I mean, what, what can you do from, from that perspective? You've got Jonathan Humphreys coaching the forwards. He's like, well, what can you do? Who knows? And then the other one is around the, the free kick speeding the game up. So you can't, don't talk about five seconds for players to box kick, for nines to box kick. Call it up. And then if you call it for free kick, tap and go, boom. So all, all of a sudden, you've, you've, you've spent it because every single box kick takes longer than five seconds. So that's going to either make them play straight away, play away and try and play fast, or it's going to speed the box kick up so that the kick isn't going to be as good. You're not going to get the players around, or you're going to get a charge down, or you turn it over and it's a free kick. And you tap and go, big fella. But there's, there's, maybe I should, world rugby, call there me up. Yeah. I've sorted it. I've nailed it. And also, I, I still also think offside lines are, are key as well. And refs, that, that needs looking at somehow, whether it's daylight or something between the back foot of a ruck. Because at the minute, it's a joke. Like, they players just on their feet, boom, off they go. Um, and referees need to take responsibility for that. You guys sort of touched on the quality of the England-Wales game, but let's just look at the detail of it a little bit more. What did you make of Billy's performance? Because you guys have talked about him being under pressure a lot from, uh, well, he's a lot of depth in the back row at the moment. Do you think he's still under pressure? Oh, you go based on getting banged a few times and put, and put back, <laughs> which is unbilly like You know, one thing I have noticed, now I don't know whether this is a respect thing because he's related to, to Lupe Falatao, their brothers, cousins, uh, uncles, they're definitely related some way, is that Billy, when he plays against uh, Tolupe Falatao, is always a little bit off. I noticed it when he played against Bath and Falatao was playing for Bath as well. I don't know whether there's that slight bit of respect and maybe there's a bit too much of it. But look, you know, Billy, we, we mentioned it before, he's a world-class player. So we're judging Billy on what Billy was a couple of years ago. But reiterating the point that we mentioned last week, the game's, you know, the game has not, it's not changed, but defensively, teams are so much better in the last year. And you go back to that England-Ireland game. 
and how physical that was. And England obviously won it comfortably or what looked comfortably. But you look at Ireland's best carriers. You look at Ireland yesterday against Georgia. They were getting absolutely smashed around the 9-10 channel because, Goody mentioned it, because the props are the size of bodybuilders and WWF wrestlers. Now, but Billy's running into them channels where in years gone by, you make yards all the time just because you believe on a polar, you've got the size, you've got a slight step. But when you're at the highest level, and albeit Wales aren't at the level that they were, but physically, they, physically they're still there around defence. They're not losing games because they're not physical enough. They're losing games because, you know, there's a few things off. Their attack isn't as good. Their line-out hasn't been as good. They're not getting the benefit of the doubt around the scrum. But for Billy, you know, was he at the level that Billy's been at? No, but... You know, you look at Curry and you look at Underhill, what they bring is they bring a different dimension to the game, which Billy does. Billy is there to carry the ball, to get England over the game line, get them on the front foot. But arguably, England are playing a different way as well, so it doesn't suit him. But yeah, Andy Rowe, don't be horrible, mate. I think that is the big point. And Andy Rowe, you are being horrible. And sticking up for Billy a bit here, Billy used to be such a standout performer because he was the main ball carrier. He was the only guy doing it. Now England have got such a balance to their forward pack you saw Mako at the weekend carrying really well again. You know, Underhill carries well. He made the break that effectively led to Henry Slade's try off, off Marrow's inside ball. Marrow's carrying. You know, all these boys are doing as good a job as Billy is. Billy's probably doing it a bit better at times, but he's, England aren't as reliant on getting over the game line as they used to be. And Billy was the go-to man now. There's more of a balance to the actual ball carries from the front five. Jamie George, another one. You know, Carl Sinclair can carry. They're all, and we said it last week, they're all proper big carriers that are sharing the workload. Um, so, you know, maybe Eddie Jones was a bit of a genius when he put Tom Curry to number eight, thinking one day we're going to have all these back row choices and Billy will be under pressure. But, you know, listen, you're looking at the French team that are coming over the weekend. It's the Shags, right? The French Shags. But Eddie Jones ain't making many changes, is he? Week to week, he's making the odd little tweak here or there. Billy's his main number eight. It will take something pretty astonishing for Eddie Jones not to pick Billy Bonapola at number eight this weekend against France and moving forward into the Six Nations. Or maybe Billy doesn't play any rugby between now and then because he's at Saracens and who knows when the championship's going to start. So I don't think he's under pressure. I think obviously people are looking at him because um, you know maybe he's not playing at the level that he was so dominant a couple of years ago. He's had a couple of arm breaks, but maybe it's because Curry and... Underhill and other ball carriers are just so phenomenal as well now. So and the way the game is now, the game yeah, is suited yeah. to defenders and breakdown. So yeah. they're the players that are standing out. So Jack Willis, for example, that's why he's standing out. And I go back to the island. You know, look at Caelan Doris. I've spoke about Emil Doris a few times before. Brilliant player. When he plays for Leinster or when he's played for Ireland a year ago, he was standing out because of he used to carry. I can't think of any. Think about any game that we've seen where you're thinking as a forward ball carrier, you're like, yeah, stand that ball carrier. Johnny May made a line break, scored a try. Could you, I, I, I'm trying to think of the games. I can't think of anyone. I can't think of seeing anyone busting the line and being like, have you seen th th this guy carrying the ball? Yeah. I don't know, mate, you're right. And my question to you then, Jim, is we had this conversation last week when I said England, you know, we're very good at what we do, but it's fairly negative or, or dull or, you know, low risk. And you're like, I fucking loved it. What about this weekend then? Exactly the same performance. Kick, kick, kick. Loads of power. Loads of like set-piece dominance. We couldn't put an average Welsh team to bed properly. We could have. We had the opportunities, but we couldn't do it. I thought, well, I, I thought Wales... I thought that's the best they played. Yeah, but did you enjoy the game? Was it? Did you get you out the edge of your seat? Were you loving it? Uh, it's a bit of a weird tournament, isn't it? Like yeah. I mentioned it before, it's just been kind of thrown together. I think the excitement... Imagine if Fiji were in it, or well, they are in it, or played games. Japan were in it, because they were initially meant to be in it. And there was fans. So you add all these things. So I'm not really on my feet. But I watched it at the weekend, knowing what we spoke about last week, and the fact that a lot of people are saying it's all over social media, saying it's a bit boring. But I'm st I'm st I still thought it was good. I still enjoyed it. I don't, again, I'm not, I'm not just saying that. I genuinely enjoyed the physical part of it. And there were some talking points around... High shots, bigger being taken out in the air. Do you reckon that's a high shot? I don't. I don't reckon it was. Elliot Daly. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, is really? It, yeah, shoulders it in the face. 
Why are you being horrible to England players for? Just, if, that, if that was a Scot, if that was a Scotsman, you're saying I would have said that's the a same. Great hit. You say that's a fucking great hit. It's like that game. Say what you see. Shoulder yeah. to the head, and he's he's done it almost like Elliot's done it like he's pissed off as well. I've looked at. I'm like, mate, you're you're getting yellow carded there. You might even get a red card because where's the mitigating circumstance in that? He didn't even look at it. I don't. Want, I said before. I don't want to see red cards. And yellow cards. So I've always said that all the way back to the Will Spencer one. But, but Elliot Daly, mate, you bit him in the face with a, a shoulder. So uh, you've at least got to look at it. I disagree. I think he was just right below the edge of where you can be. I think he hit him top of the chest. And I, you know, I, I hear you, James. I love how that's all we're talking about from the game. Uh, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> that's you've how bad it was. You've mentioned it about three times. What did you make at Ireland's win over Georgia? Were you thrilled with that one, Jimbo? Or? Watched the first bit a bit. Great to see Billy score. Um, yes. He was a spark, actually, wasn't he? To be fair, in a dull performance, Billy played well. Yeah, he did, yeah. But I, I tell you, I was happy about Georgia. And again, labouring old points that we spoke about. Physicality around defence. It's the easiest thing to fix around your defence, get your structures right. Ireland are a Route 1 China team. Would you be Can frustrated you if you... Can you say Route 1 China now? Well, everything's getting back to normal in the summer, so we can say China again. Okay. Yeah. China. Um, <laughs> why, did, why is it called Route 1 China? Do they, do they head... Is it in one direction in China? Is that all you go? Do you go through? Ah, Great Wall of China. Run straight through the wall, China. No? You aren't good, do I don't know. I think it's... It might be... I'm just... I'm Googling it. Route 1 China. I reckon you've just made it up, Jim. It's what we it? always say, but... Route 1 to China. I is it Route 1 know. to China? Route 1 China. It must be a motorway in China. I think, I think it's a gymism, to be honest. Route 1 China is a gymism. You know I can count to 10 in Chinese. Well, I don't think it's 10. Do you want to hear me count in Chinese? Go on then. Yeah. Yuck ye sam, sam say yuck. Yuck ye sam say um lung chuck and the bats out suck. <laughs> <laughs> who's well, Sam sucking off that's what I want to know no it's Baps Out Suck genuinely any Chinese people out there um, we might even get taken down for saying China so many times but yeah that is me counting that is me honouring the late purport where do you stand on the Jacob Stockdale pass that was called Ford which meant Stuart McCloskey's trial was disallowed <sighs> this is the point mate this, uh, I ain't bothered <laughs> this is the thing <laughs> French ref? I'm not bothered. If he, got, if he got the try, if he didn't get the try, I was just... And I saw these tweets going out with these graphics about where, how the pitch is laid and velocity. Like, it's over my head. I've watched it, I was like, mate, it's a try. If, he, if it goes slightly back or even if it goes flat, he's still scoring. So just let him have the try, big fella. But would I say that if it was a World Cup final... Scotland versus New Zealand and New Zealand through that pass. I don't know. Goody, what are the laws? Rules is rules. Who knows? I don't, because I've, well, I've seen so many different things around it. Exactly. And you look at uh, what Andy Farrell said after the game. He said he doesn't even know the law anymore and what's right and what's wrong. Um, you've seen him give them. You've seen refs pulling up for the same thing. Mate, I ain't got a clue. Basically, I thought if it comes out your hands backwards, it's play on. There's some momentum rule or law that allows the ball to travel forwards if, you know, your hands are going backwards. Who knows, mate? I reckon it was a try. Just kick it. But, but be pissed it off that it, as well. It's like, it's like Jim said, though. In another game, in a bigger game, if that is a, you know, um, a match-decided game, it is the biggest thing in the world that week, right? But because it's Ireland against Georgia in the Autumn Nations Cup, Ireland won, you know and it was a dour game it didn't affect the result like Jim says who cares <laughs> but it's bad though because that could happen in a big game and you've seen them given World Rugby needs to come out and say Roman Pratt was awful for Wales against England and uh, Matthew Raynal doesn't know what a forward pass is or not a forward pass but hey I'd have given it to the stock horse because that would have been three tries and three games for him how do you have got it but no try well second string France side beat Italy easily on Saturday night and they'll face England in the final this weekend so let's find out a bit more about them we're speaking to former France hooker Benjamin Kayser. How are you, mate? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Cheers, boys. You're looking... <laughs> I, don't I don't know if I can say like good. <laughs> but with the moustache and everything, it's not the same. It's just not the same. No, you're looking, you're looking great. 
Thank you. It's great to have you on, Benji. Uh, we obviously know each other very well, the same as Goody with our time at Leicester. We can maybe talk a little bit about that. But uh, what I'm struggling, right, I'm watching the games, I even watch the, the France-Italy game. Your vocabulary and your depth of the English dictionary, how? Well, I mean, because you were at Leicester with me, that's where you learn English. So you've actually learned English from me, but you know more than me. Mate, he's German. Um, he's German as well. <laughs> My, my, my trick is that I took the best thing out of England and, and left France with it, which is my wife. And she's not from Leicester, so she doesn't, she doesn't speak <laughs> like, like, like you, basically. <laughs> but uh, no, no, I, I traveled a lot when I was young. So I always sort of spoke English, but obviously uh, be, being in Leicester helped. Uh, it, got, it got me going. You know, rugby is a, is, is, a, is, a mate, is a sport of mates, of camaraderie, of just having a few laughs, socializing. So obviously you need to chat, you need to be open to others and that helps but um and it's it's proving to be very very useful it is very very useful you even used the word lucidity and i didn't know whether <laughs> that was quick <laughs> i didn't know does that mean quick does it I'll mean strong what, what do you mean it's <laughs> it's it, i actually got a few comments uh, from that one to be uh, to, totally honest and i'm giving you uh, uh, my, my total honesty in french it's a very basic word but I just, it's called lucidité and people use it all the time. And I just added lucidity. I wasn't even sure that it worked in English, but it did the trick. So I'm, I'm chuffed. Right, it was very good. And how, how have you taken to retirement, mate? Because obviously, um, you know, you're all over the TV at the minute. It's great to see Amazon's going well. I know you're doing a bit with BT Sport as well. Everyone's been really impressed. How are you finding retirement? Because let's not beat around the bush. Obviously, something horrific happened last week. Um, to Christoph Dominici and, and you know that's massively sad and, and it is hard to retire but you seem to have taken that move into the media and, and, and everything that you're doing with it like a Dr. Water. Well thank you Goody that's probably the only nice thing you ever said to me ever. Oh but well. This <laughs> is... <laughs> no no I, to, be, to be honest it's um, I, think, I think you're spot on it really took me back to what it is to stop rugby what it is to go away from a team environment of having a WhatsApp group where there's 150 jokes a day to being on your own. So I retired because, because my neck is fucked and I didn't want to take an extra X. I already had two ops of, of two levels. I didn't want to take a third one. And so I decided to pack it. It was a little bit of a sudden thing, but I mean, my last game, the good thing is that I, I was 35. Same choice at 25 is horrendous thing to do. It's what we all love. It's the boys. It's the team. It's the excitement. It's the game. It's the Saturdays. It's the change rooms just before when you want to puke it. It's the change rooms just after when you've won. You know, it's all those feelings that I just have to, 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 to admit that I will never feel again. But that's fine. You know, we have the, the memory book is full. Uh, my heart is full of fantastic memories and, and I don't feel bad for it. What I didn't uh, think about was the, the fact that I, I think I need to process things. And from the moment where I finished the final, I gave my car back. I went on holiday for four days. The first thing I did was to leave that group. And I was just flat out on trying to do some other things and not really taking the time to press pause. And, and to be honest, I've always been like, Listen, at some point, I'm going to have to do it. Yeah, you know, press pause, assess what you've done, see where you are mentally. And then what happened to Domi really brought me, brought me back to, fuck, I need to take care of this now. Um, I think it's one thing to take care of your mate by saying, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. And then you move on because we're boys. And we, we think we've got big balls and that we don't need to share. But, but it's different when we're, we're just special animals, professional, uh, comp uh, high sports, especially rugby players with, with the intensity, the physicality and all that. We're special animals. We thrive on that pressure. We thrive on hitting people. I mean, Jimbo, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure you must be doing something at some point that gets all that anger out of you because otherwise you'll, go, you'll, you'll lose your shit. Well, I just spoke to the lads earlier. There was a guy at Evan Cycle Shop who nearly got put through a wall because he was looking for a refund. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you joke, you joke. But I mean, I finished the 16th of June, 2019. And after that, I was like, stuff it. I'm going on holiday. I'm not doing anything. So I was working, doing other things. You still get tired. But I wasn't training at all. After five weeks, my wife tapped on my shoulder. She's like, listen, you've got to do something. You're losing your shit. I was getting irritable. You know, you lose your temper pretty quick. You get frustrated very quick. Just because normally day in, day out. I mean, after a, a scrum session, I'm pretty, I was pretty chilled, you know, to assess things and to think about things because my body was a wreck. And, and that, that emotion, that outlet, basically, I didn't have anymore. And um, so I've been thinking a lot about the fact that if we're brothers on the pitch, we need to be brothers after. Uh, that I think is maybe France is not a good example for that, but they do take you in, chew you up, and then chuck you out. And there's a few examples of, of guys that really scare me because I didn't know where they were going. Domi was an extraordinary human being. 
he was a charismatic, flamboyant, uh, incredibly smart, almost um, like street smart. You know, the, the guy, you would, he, always give the, he was absolutely tiny. He was tiny. But you would chuck a bone in the middle of a, of, of a room, and I'm telling you, he would tear to shred to pieces any big fella. He was, he was the type of guy that I would have followed him anywhere. So I can't say that I was friends with him because I had too much respect, and I, I, I pretty much had a poster of him when I, when I grew up um, learn, loving, falling in love with rugby. I followed Stade Francais because that's where I started when I was 14, and he was the man. He was killing it every weekend. He was, did obviously the 99 World Cup, John Olomu, the semi-final, and took him. Everybody remembers that that's who he was. But he was the type of guy that would never motivate the guys by telling, oh, you should you know, take this right hand pass this way and, and do this ice bath, whatever. He was like, strap a pair on, show everybody how big your balls are, and just follow me. If you, if you, if you follow me, nothing will ever happen to you. And I, I was thinking, this guy is so small, but he's so, he's so driven, he's so passionate, he's so full of confidence that I have to do 10 times what he does. That was his way of being a leader, you know? And especially when I was young, he helped me a lot. Like, he would never speak to me when things were going right. But every time he saw, I was pretty much shitting myself. I struggled at the beginning of my career, the mental aspect of the game, especially at the moment of line-out throwing. Playing rugby is easy, but going back to the line-out, the stress of the crowd, the people, the whatever. And he, he would, you know, he was the type of guy who would just put his, his hand around your back and be like, just follow me. You'll be right. He would crack you a joke, talk about going out, doing whatever it is, but just to get your mind off things. Um, and, and to me, he was brilliant. I, I didn't have any boots at the time. That night, he called the Nike guy. He got me a contract for the next five years. I tried to say sorry, to say sorry, to say thank you by giving him a bottle of wine. He chucked it back into my car. He's like, the last time he tried to give me something. He just gave everything, never asked for anything back. He, he's just a brilliant dude. A brilliant dude that filled the cracks out of post-rugby career with shit. Um, that struggled to find something exhilarating enough to fill those gaps of, like I said, of this, uh, the, our mental side, that we need, we need an outlet, we need something. And unfortunately, he didn't get it. And I think what happened this summer uh, was just a, b- a bit too much to swallow, where he, he was the, the front man for this Qatari investors who were going to buy Bizier, an old legendary French club, and take them back from second division, where they are sort of uh, being a bit average. And for some of, uh, I think the mayor of Bézier is the most racist guy you will ever see. And so he hated to see that those Qatari were, were here. So there was a bit of sort of that political side of rugby that we don't like. And the, the, the project ended up being chucked to the bin because they didn't trust the investors and all that. I think he took that really badly because he was the face of it. He sort of made them look like a fool a little bit, whereas it wasn't, if you know what I mean. And, um, and, and then this shit happened. So I think it's remember the, the incredible rugby player. But just remember the incredible human being to say that if your mind decides to do something, absolutely nothing can stop you. He was the, the, like the image of that. Uh, that it's not a matter of size and stuff. It's you have big balls enough. I mean, life is just a... He was the guy who would walk into a nightclub, you know, and he would end up in, in the VIP, whatever, speaking to the football players and all that. Not because they recognize him. Just because he had that swagger, that chat, that thing. Whereas I would be, you know, hiding somewhere. And then he would just... He, yeah, I don't know. He just had this extra thing. He just had this light. He would charismatic dude. So remember that, and remember if we can learn something that he would be that would be important to him is to say we need to look after each other. It's 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 it's, it's too sad as fuck to realize that just because we didn't somebody didn't land a hand at some point that this stuff it, it should just should never happen. Well, yeah, absolutely, Benji, <clears throat> mate. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm sure it's very raw. Uh, we didn't know how much detail we wanted to go into about that because. There's a lot of talk about that at the minute, you know, around the mental health stuff. Me and Goody were, were, were chatting about it off here before. Me and Andy Rowe and Goody have all spoken about it. The amount of people that reach out to us here on the Rugby Pod, private messages, uh, speak to us in the street, and the fact that you're speaking about it as well. And again, you know, we don't just want to speak about it because another incredibly sad accident has happened with uh, Christoph. It's, a, it, you know, the whole hashtag rugby family gets around and starts posting tweets and, and stuff. Something needs to be done. You know, in French rugby, like we mentioned, I think you mentioned it then, and we, we speak about it a lot in terms of French rugby being left behind when it comes to professionalism. The RPA, you know, the Scotland Rugby Union, I'm sure the other uh, other unions are talking about this stuff. They have done, and, you know, it's Grow a Mo for a Bro. Movember are quite active out there as well. From a French perspective, I know you're over in England now, do they do enough for the players after rugby, do you think? Or is there a lot more that needs to be done? 
I, th I think a lot more needs to be done. But at the same time, you always take good and bad examples of guys who've managed, you know, to spin off a, a rugby career. Nobody's going to take your hand, you know, and give serve it to you on a silver platter. Is that there's also a lot of guys who don't push themselves hard enough, who whilst they're playing are like, oh, no, no, I can't keep on studying. I can't go and do some networking. I can't just, just have a, an interest in something else because I need to sleep, because I need to play PlayStation, because I need to, you know, whatever it is. Um, so it's also, it's down to motivation. But I do think rugby, need, at the moment, rugby players need, need to help. I, I mean, Goody, you probably played 20 years or something of professional rugby. This is never going to happen again. Mm. Boys are going to be broken after 10 years, or maybe 12 years max. Yeah. Of course, they're going to cash in a lot more than what we did for a long time. Okay, fair enough. But still, it's, it's never enough. And you're going to need that. You're going to have a lot of horror stories of guys who are going to finish really young and stuff. So I think we need to keep on, be forced almost to push to the reality of, of having other interests. Maybe even like, like, like I know Saracens. I don't know the inside story exactly of the salary cap in Saracens. Okay, I don't know the whole shebang. But I knew one thing that when they said about the co-investments thing, I was outraged to see that that was a problem. Mate, if there's one thing that we should be taking from all those presidents, the, imagine the equivalent of Nigel Ray in France. There's loads of them who are businessmen who've got a lot of cash, who want to invest in rugby, but they know a shit ton about business. Do you think we would have not liked to have a co-investment one of those guys? Bloody hell, I would have said yes. Mm -hmm. You know, just build a company with somebody and give me a, a chance. So I don't know if that's the reality of exactly what happened. I'm just saying, Let's use all those business minds basically to build a future together because otherwise the outcomes are, are, are just not that big. We're asking people to make a lot more sacrifices. So it's a lot more risk and stuff. So to answer your question, Jimbo, I think, I think France is, is behind, not because of a lack of professionalism, not because of a lack of, of, the, well, of connections in the brains for, between French and English players, if you compare them to where, not that. It's just the fact that in France, nobody is pushing the same way. The federation is pushing on one way. The league is pushing on the other and the players are sort of caught in the middle and they don't know which, which way to go. So nobody's, there's no one common goal of saying, listen, let's make rugby sustainable, good to watch, profitable uh, money-wise and a fantastic game. There's, let's make clubs as big and rich and incredibly um, well rewarded for their TV rights. And there's the federation saying, let's try to win the World Cup, but bloody hell, we've got to fill the, the stadium. Because at the moment, it's just, it's just a money thing. So the problem is that nobody's going the same way. But it's, it's, it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> in the French rugby pod, we speak about it all the time because it's so frustrating, so, so incredibly frustrating. But I, ho I hope things are going to move. And that, that brings us on to the point, and I, I don't want to mention the salary cap because Jim's bitter. He only got two one-bedroom flats overlooking the M1 in Luton. Well, I've, grown, I've grown another house of ice and well. <laughs> <laughs> Maratoji has like four million quid in a business. But... The big thing is, in you mentioned it then, the difference between the LNR and the FFR in France, the league and the, the union, they're so far apart, which brings us to the conversation of this weekend and what France team we're going to see coming up against England because of the litigation, because of the war effectively on the pawns in the middle, which are the players and how much they can play and who for. And we now see in the Autumn Nations Cup, the grand final, the big England versus France, the crunch, whatever you want to call it. It's an unbelievable game. We've all played in it. Well, Jim hasn't because he was it wasn't good enough to play for England, so he went to play for Scotland. But we've all we played in it, and it's unbelievable, right? This weekend, because of what's happened in France, we're seeing France's second team come over and play for a trophy, which is a massive shame. Not one of those players that beat England in the Six Nations and started that game is playing this weekend, and it must be as a French international yourself, someone that works well in the media. How frustrating is that for you as well to see you know a second team coming over here to play against England for the trophy? So, I mean, you're, you're, you're dead right that it's, it's very frustrating. In the same time, this Autumn Nations Cup without Fiji because they couldn't play, without Japan because they couldn't come, is a bit random, right? I mean, it's, it's a competition that had to be pulled. There. I am delighted to see international rugby every weekend. I mean, we've been waiting long enough. It's the rugby that we all love. It's fantastic. But at least it gives a little spin-off to the fact that we're going to see England, France in, in the next couple of months. He didn't want to do an exact remake. This just highlights the fact that when you think that French rugby is better, it's a fact, but it's definitely not there yet. So in February, the tension is... So one thing that you need to, remind, uh, to re remember as well is that the next World Cup is in France. So there's, there's a lot more now than just rugby. There's basically France, then like the miniature sport, or like, listen, boys, you guys need to sort your shit. Because 
there's going to be a magic, like a magic light on France in the next couple of years. And we can't look like idiots of, you know, like fighting between all of us and stuff. We need to have a, a genuine consensus of let's go all drive in the same direction. That lasted February, March, April, last six nations. <laughs> then pandemic hit. Everybody's shocked. Obviously, the whole world is, 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 is collapsing around us and stuff. And everything was very tight because the financial power of top 14 is there. Like they, they can barely breathe already when things are, go, are, are good. So imagine six months without their home games uh, when 75% of the budget is basically a home game revenue. Then, of course, they're, everybody's shaken massively. So the tension is sky high. Bernard Laporte decided as the federation president to, because don't forget that the league is, has basically, the league is not, was created by the federation. They, ha, they, they have delegated rights to organize um, first and second division professional rugby in France. So any second that the, the federation decides, oh, listen, we don't need you anymore. We're going to take you in-house. They could, technically. And the league, the league hates that because they're the one who created the wealth of French rugby, to be fair. They created this economy around it and stuff. So when you think everything's back, six weeks ago, the, the, the league or the, the presidents of the clubs threatened not even to release the players. And I was like, bloody hair, here we go. We're back again. And we look like idiots, I think. And before that, were... well, before that, Benji, you had Laporte and Mohad Altred were doing a Jim yeah. Hamilton and Sarah Rambini, mate. They were locked up <laughs> for three days <laughs> as well. It's, uh, you know what, and, and I say this with the utmost respect and we joke about it, but it is almost the saying, so French. You know, when you look at it, do you, do you think there's a, because when you watch France on the pitch now and you look at the influence that guys like Sean Edwards has had and you're looking at the calibre of players and the quality of youngsters coming through, and a lot of people agree, me, agree with me when I say it, and a lot of people are saying the same things. Mate, France are arguably the form team in the world at the minute if they could put their best team out there. The World Cup, like we were just speaking about, is in two years. Mate, you've got a team there that can win the World Cup, but there's, a, there's drama everywhere. Mate, there's drama in every union, every, everything that's going on. Is the light just on France because it's a different language? I don't know. I'm trying to work out why it just seems to be there's so much more drama. We, we, we are special animals, what do you want me to say? We're, we're, we are random. But in the same time, in the same time we, we're, we're a, capable of the most incredible highs that, know, that everybody else is sort of jealous of. We're capable out of passion and emotion and sheer and sometimes anger to actually outperform anyone because rugby is a physical sport. And you know how it is when 15 guys have decided to, to do something, it can cause incredible things. Um, but that's, that's just us. We, 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 I think it's part of French DNA, basically, to be problematic, to, be, to, to like to steer things up and, and to, be, to be on the edge. But that is all down to the structure of French rugby, which is 10 years too late into catching up, trying to get more professional. Remember how I said that the league got delegated rights? But the reason why the federation didn't take them in-house, because the federation, until Bernard Laporte arrived, was, I mean, if you had an audit of a proper, like a business guy who doesn't know anything about rugby, goes to see the federation, has a look at the books, I think he would, he, he would fall over his chair. I mean, it, it, it was not done to be profitable. It was done to have fun. It was done to have, you know, mates, to have hotels and restaurants and this and that and not organized. So they couldn't do it. So basically, I think it's down, down to who we are as a country, as people, and the organization of, of the, the, the structure of French rugby. We're talking about the structure. Obviously, we are going to see a game this weekend and you've got a lot of intel on what we're going to see. There's some, still some unbelievable players coming out for France at the weekend. That squad of 31 they've announced. Uh, Cameron Wocky is unbelievable. Jalanche as well. Uh, and Makalu, who you've played with. Um, anyone else that we should be looking at thinking this guy's going to be a star? He's got a massive opportunity to actually take a foot into the, the, the starting French team when we see the Six Nations kick off again? Um... Well, you've named them. To be honest, Makalu was expecting a lot more of them from last week. I think it was a bit of a... You could tell they were... Uh, how do you say that? That the strategy was not to expose themselves too much for the first 20, 30 minutes, whatever. They play very defensive, very cautious stuff. Non-stop kicking. Brice Dulin, everything. Teddy Thomas started kicking. I mean, I don't think I've you ever seen You weren't happy about kick. that. You weren't happy about that. <laughs> yeah, he's, he is the fastest guy I've ever seen. Like, lightning fast. But, and then he starts walking and he kicks a diagonal kick. He doesn't have a fucking clue where it's going. But he's just trying to, I don't know, play strategy or whatever. When, you know, it's just not convincing enough. I want to play, see guys play at their full ability. 
show what you've got because I think there's a lot of talent and because that's the only way that I can sort of justify my anger of not seeing, like you said, the full French side every time, the frustration that it generates. So at least let's see some young blood to prove everybody that not only we have a good starting 15, but bloody hell, the wealth, the wealth of the youth of French rugby is ginormous. The number of Kiwi guys, I mean, how many, uh, pop, what's the population of New Zealand? Like 6 million people or something. That's not even Paris. And, and, and the number of ex-All Blacks who are like, I am astonished of the quality of young players that you have. But either they don't play, either sometimes they're poorly coached in a top 14 that hits very, very hard but doesn't prepare to international rugby because it's averagely refed and it's all about physicality. And they just don't understand it. You know what I mean? So the only good thing that I would have seen is let's see Macalou, who can be incredibly good. Jelonche is one of the hardest hitters of top 14. He's like a Juan Smith, like a big fella. Cameron Voki, I agree with you. I think Gerasi, you know, the, the, second, the ginger second row, he's a bit like a French Alwyn Jones. So he's double world champion. And he was the lineup guru and stuff. Just a very clinical, uh, hardworking, made for international rugby. He can run for days. I think he had a decent game last week, but I'm, I can't wait to see him again. Um, I think Etriard might start the hooker for Toulon, the captain who was meant to be basically with the French team before, but got injured before. He's a very solid, reliable um, hooker. I can't, I can't wait to see him. And uh, who else you got in the backs? Well, in the backs, you have Baptiste Couillou. You guys maybe don't know him very well. The number nine for Lyon. Yeah. He is electric. He is very good. And on the bench will be Sébastien Bézy, the nine for Clermont, who is Aaron Smith. He is lightning fast. And if he comes on, he can do some serious damage. And of course, on the wing, Olivier Tiraka, the, the, the Fijian born, who's, who's now French for Clermont. I think he'll start because Teddy Thomas also played three games. So he can't play this weekend again. So they're going to have to rotate a tiny bit. So Sora and Teddy Thomas are out, for instance, because they play three, three match sheets. Um, and, and, and Raka can just be incredible. And I do think Brice Dulin, the fullback, which is experienced, probably the only experienced guy, he still has a lot more under, un, under the belt. I mean, he's... His quality, I think he's made for international rugby. He can, he can prove it. So, result, do you think they can knock England off whatever thing they're still on at the minute? Got their fans, but <laughs> it is weird, isn't it? It's, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, I'm at the games as well, Benji. I know that you're commentating and doing a fantastic job and that insight, I think, for our listeners as well. But also when you're talking about the game from a French perspective, no one's ever done it before and given us that much insight. So, again... Bigging you up a little bit there, but when you look at it, and you get, if you're giving us a, I don't know, head and heart, we'll probably talk a little bit about both. You look at this England team, we just know that they're a very good team. However, they want to play. If France got an opportunity. If there's any team that can do it, it's a team like France. England by twenty, no chance. Maybe not, maybe not twenty, <laughs> but I, I sort of agree with Goody. It's it's going to be a tough one. England are very very solid. Um, seem to, I mean, I think what the last two defeats is the World Cup final and France in February. So that's, that's, that's a pretty big statement, you know. It's, it's pretty reliable. Um, I feel that they're very, very powerful at the moment. I feel that they, they're not playing extraordinary rugby, but they're never threatened. And I do feel that I was expecting more, basically. The same French team that played against Italy will be, will be beaten by 25 points or something. Uh, I really do think in a week, a bit more self-belief back in themselves. They sort of had to beat Italy. They're meant to lose against England. It has a different mindset. You know, you can actually go and have a crack at it and not worry about l looking difficultly. So my heart wants to say that it's possible that they, that they win. You never know. I do think it will, be, it will be a loss. But I do think if they challenge England and the, the second French team shows that they're ready to, to challenge them in, in Twickenham, I think that will be a victory already. And one of the things you mentioned there as well, and I've got to ask you about it because you've played both sides of the... Uh, the, the, the channel in England and in France and you've seen differences across the world in how games are refereed you mentioned it just before about players in the top 14 are averagely refereed can we just discuss how bad Roman Poit is because he was horrific at the weekend <laughs> and just French refs in general I bang on about it and it's a bit of fun but also there's a bit of seriousness there some of the refs are bang average aren't they we, we, we both do are we being harsh on Roman Poit or not are, are we blinking I think, I think you're being I think you're being harsh why I think you're being harsh because if it was uh, Jaco Piper, if it was, uh, what's the name of the guy who rushed the 2011 uh, final, Greg Joubert? Yeah. No, nobody went that hard to them. I thought they were atrocious. But nobody, nobody had a go at them. The only thing with Romain Poitier, he's got a bit of an attitude. He's, he's got a bit of that backing. You know, he speaks with that, with that English accent, with that French accent in English, and he's sort of explaining things to everyone. 
Um, but I, I actually think... really like that. I, Benji, I like that about him. I actually yeah. quite like that he, he has got that arrogance, but we were talking about it. The way that he ref the scrum, you know, the TMO making calls coming in around the, the high tackles and stuff and tackling in the air. I don't know. Mm. I just... I don't, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe we are blinkered and we're being... Uh, is, is there such a word as anti-French refist? I don't even know if there is a saying. There is now, mate. Hey, <laughs> use that one. Benji, use that one on comps, mate. <laughs> <laughs> to storm. No, I, I, do, I do think he, he's made... I mean, I think it was him who ref the third game of the All Blacks Lions test, you know, of that last yeah. kickoff, whatever. Well, I yeah. do think he cocked that one massively. That, that was, mm. that was, he got eaten, basically, by Sam Warburton. Yeah. He got, he got eaten. Uh, which was which wasn't great to see. I think refs make mistakes all the time. I rate Nigel Owens for making the tough decisions when he needs to. I think in the last Champions Cup final, he cocked up massively ten minutes before consecutively twice because he just didn't want to take that big decision. And I think that's what Romain Poit is doing at the moment. He's just not taking those big decisions. They're overusing the uh, video refereeing just because they want to be super cautious. So the scrums repetitively, you know, go on and again. No, so I, I don't think he's, he's the worst at all. I think French refs have got their qualities. But the problem of, of French refereeing in France is it's not so much the refs themselves. It's the fact that they are under so much stress that if you make a team lose at home, I mean, you're going to look over your, your shoulders if somebody's not going to shoot you in the head after the game. <laughs> no way. Is it, it's, it's not a thing. Is it really that old school still? Oh, mate. Well, not, not, in, not everywhere, but certain places. Yeah, definitely. There's guys who don't even watch the games. They're just sitting on the next on the stand, just yelling things at a scrum the whole, the whole time. Just, okay, okay. It's just they're letting their anger out. And, and it is very, very old school. It's very my village, your village. You know, you're not going to drop your flag over here. This is my land. It's a bit like that. So, so there is a lot of pressure. There's also assistant refs, sort of touch judges, that are not professional. And most of them, I feel that they just rock up the Saturday and they're, oh, I'm going to have a cracking time. I'm going to Marcel Michelin, you know, lifting a flag from time to time. And they just, they don't care. They're all Clermont fans. They're Clermont fans that do it there, aren't they? <laughs> no, 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 no Clermont fans. But, but you know, that's, that's, that was one of the things that I raised when, when I spoke to the refs and stuff. How, it's good to have one professional ref, but let's have teams of refs who sort of know to, how to work together with the touch judges and stuff. They never keep the same trio, ever. It's only the, the, the ref in the middle who gets assessed because they're professional or semi-professional. And the guys on the side, they rock up on the Saturday morning, they raise a few flags and then they fuck off home and they had a great time. So I, I, I think that's, that's one of the reasons why. But to be honest, rugby is complicated to ref and French players at rugby are complicated to ref as well because we, 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 we like to, you know, to be on the edge of things all the time. So it's, it's not easy. Benji, before you go, now you've... Probably no one's going to listen to it now because you've wasted all your material on here. But you've launched a new podcast, which has been going a few weeks. I've listened to all of them. Of course I have. Uh, very original lane. Le French podcast, get it? Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? So if the millions of listeners, you know, you might get five or six that might come across and listen to yourself, <laughs> producer Tim and BT. <laughs> Mate, it's, it's exactly that. Myself, Johnny BT and Tim Groves, we, we, we've launched that. But just to answer the questions, basically, that everybody's got on French rugby. The, the, ex, the exotic side of French rugby killed the myth um, you go back to reality, the good stories. There's also some incredible players that play in top 14, whether they're French or foreigners that we usually do, you don't really hear of. So it's to get an insight on with the reality of French rugby. The news is just constant between the political battles, the actual sporting events and everything that's around it and the quality of players that are there. It's just a powerhouse of European rugby. So we thought, because that's all the questions that I get every time that I, I, I in England is but how come France how come this how come that and so basically we want to answer all those questions chat about it and and we're really enjoying it so far all right Benjamin well thank you very much for coming on the show best of luck with Le French podcast and you're on Amazon again this weekend aren't you I am yeah uh, England England France at Twickenham Sunday afternoon best of luck have a good thanks call. a lot guys Top, top bloke, bloke mate. Oh, good. Absolute, top bloke. Absolute legend. Having played with him and some of the stories, I mean, do you remember the stories about him and Castro? Can't mention them. Um, <laughs> great bloke, eh? I was, I was Leicester with, with Ben. I'd spent a lot of time with him. He's, he's a fantastic bloke. Um, and we can talk about his credentials in the media. I mean, what a, he's a phenomenal. Yeah. I, there, there ain't, I don't remember anyone, anyone, tell me, that, who can do what he's doing. And he's... Jokes aside, and maybe it's not a joke, maybe it is a joke, he speaks better English and his vocabulary and his 
delivery is better than, not just better than mine, it's probably better than yours, Scooby, as well. well it is, it's better than most people, most English people, to be fair. Um, and that, he must have just picked up the lingo from you in Leicester, but he doesn't mm. sound like it. No, it doesn't. No, but no, we, no, it makes me, makes me realise, actually, I forget, I'm 40, I turned 40 in lockdown, and I played with Benny Kays the same time as you, but Leicester and all that stuff, and he came over from Stade Francais, and I'm like, this boy's proper young buck, proper player. He just told me he's 35. I thought he was so much younger than that. He looks great. He's retired. His missus got him training again. Why didn't my missus tell me to train? I think, well, like, does it matter? I've told <laughs> you to train. I'm basically like your missus and you haven't listened. Uh, so, yeah, but what a bloke, though. Um, you know, speaks his mind, very honest, and, you know, doesn't hold back. And, yeah, he's, he's doing exceptionally well. He's brilliant on comms. And, yeah, mate, what a bloke. Pleasure to play with him. Well, let's get your predictions in the Guinness Match Pint Predictor this weekend then. With free pints and pubs sadly temporarily off the table right now, Match Pint and Guinness have teamed up to offer the overall winner of each round the ultimate Guinness game day bundle, which includes cans for the game, Guinness glasses, a rugby ball to chuck around in the living room, delivery vouchers, and some other awesome snacks, as well as heaps of Guinness stash. And we've finished round three now, and as promised, the leader of the Rugby Pod League is being sent one of those bundles in time for the final round of games. So, Morgan Owen, it's on its way to you, mate. So, definitely Welsh. I don't want to stereotype by looking at names. Welshman. Mate, the English ca- cricket captain is Owen Morgan, spelled slightly differently, but in reverse, and he's Irish. So, mate, you can't make these judgments, James. Very true. Morgan Owen could be Scottish. What's his flag? Welsh. There we go, he's Welsh. <laughs> he's Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Over 4,500 rugby pod listeners are in our league already, and there's one round to go, so one more chance to win some prizes. You can still join in. Just download the Match Pint app from all good app stores, predict the winner and margin of each game, and use the code RugbyPod to join our league. How are you boys getting on? You going all right? I still you can't work out games. the algorithm. I can't work it. Mate, who's getting a perfect score? It's, it's complete pot luck. I'll be honest, the Norse Andy Rowe, look at his face. He's like, mm-hmm, I got one ah. last week. <laughs> I am tearing it up. Mate, no one cares about you though, Andy. That's, let's just they leave it. You're a Kiwi. Fear. I do need to question that. You've got a Scottish flag as your team of choice. Ancestry is Scottish, mate, and that was the only choice oh, I had, mate. so I went with that. But he lives in England. He lives in England. Ireland, Scotland. Who's winning this one, boys? And by how much? This is hard to call now, isn't it? I think it's really hard to call. Ireland by... Oh, Jim, really? Jim. I thought Scotland were in form. They they are in form. You've been winning loads of games. What's that? You're not back in Scotland because Donkey wears a a turn. Mate, you can't say that, Jim. That's horrible. Why are you being so horrible? No, that isn't the reason why. That isn't the reason why. I just think we lack a little bit of power. And I think Ireland... Not playing that well against Georgia, they'll be uh, pissed off the top of the morning, they will. Um, oh, gosh. We, we've been coming really close to Ireland now. Not that that's a victory, but um, <laughs> that's I'm going to change. I've, I've changed. On the spot here, I'm going. Oh, I can't. You've already, you've already got an Ireland. Yeah, I'll go Ireland. I'll go Ireland by six. Oof. I want to say it's got. I might change in the week. I get a feel for it. Like I changed. My prediction this week yeah. for one of the games. So, yeah. mm. and, it, and it's working because you're a thousand and sixtieth. So <laughs> I've got one result wrong, which is the France Scotland game. Yes, uh, I think Scott will be happy that you're not going for them to be fair. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go Ireland by ten. There you go, uh, Wales, Italy. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I've just paused. How bad is that? I just paused. Oh, Wales yes. by fifteen. Fifteen. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'd say Wales really? by yeah. And the problem is Wales are down on confidence, so they're not scoring many points. And it, Italy have just is taken. Is it in Wales? It's in Wales. Italy have just taken thirty by a France second team. So uh, Wales by twelve. England v France. Who's winning this one? England by eight. I think France will give them a proper ding dong. Do you reckon? Hmm. I don't think England have hugely been tested from an attacking sense. And I think France have got, regardless of what team they put out, have got the players to do that. Yeah, I think England might click this weekend. Uh, so I'm going to say England by 20. What? Yeah, it's the French shags, mate. It's the bin juice are coming over. Well, it might be off, but at the moment it's still on. Fiji, Georgia. 
Mate, Fiji by about 100 points because they are absolutely raging. They've been locked up for, locked up, don't let me out for two weeks. We spoke to Ndolo last week. He's even messaged me on Twitter saying, you wait for this weekend. There's gonna oh, be no. Tri- oh, there's going to be, no. hey, there's going to be tricks, <laughs> tricks coming out of the bag everywhere. Um, actually, Fiji by 35, I'm going to say. Oh, oh do, I, do I go Fiji by uh, 50? Uh. No, I'm going to go Fiji by 20. Uh. Wow, okay. Let's have a look at the Premiership then. You guys said there might be quite a few surprise results this season, and there was this weekend. Cool. Quinn's fluke to win. Don't know how they've done that. Mate, honestly, you can't say that, Jim. So Quinn's a fluke to win at Northampton. You can he you can say it. Well, you can he say it. I didn't even see the game. How horrible am I? Yeah, no, they dominate. <laughs> Quinn's dominated Northampton. Northampton, big worry for them. They've lost eight home games on the spin now. My goodness me. But let's bypass that and just talk about Gloucester's absolute dispastagement of a what? Wasps. A, a what? Dispas- <laughs> a dispastagement. Yeah, I mean, do you know what? I spoke, what, to, what, what, I, spoke, I spoke to a Gloucester player this week and he said he'd listened to the pod. He, he'd listened to Jim Hamilton tipping them to get relegated. I didn't. I said it in raging. one line. So, I said it in one line. You know, Martin uh, St. Quinton, mate, the it, owner. Martin St. Quinton, the owner, called me out on Twitter. He owns a club. Did he? Oh, it was <laughs> like, if you didn't get a gauge that I was taking the piss and I did mean to say Gloucester are going to be top two. I think <laughs> you were. I think you were very serious, mate. Well, I, I think you were, I picked them for top four last season. And yeah, then, uh, mate. It depends what, what Danny Cipriani turns up. There you go. I've said it, mate. Sips didn't even play. Wasn't even picked this weekend. He was. Uh, he was. He wasn't even on the bench. Wasn't picked. Uh, they've changed their team from the team that played against Leicester, and Lloyd Evans at ten was unbelievable. So it's the Lloyd Evans team, mate. Pick him every week. No sips. No problem. So I didn't know whether we were going to go into too much detail about that because I did see Lloyd Evans with the tension and I haven't, I mean, there's only so much rugby you can consume between Friday night and Monday afternoon when we record the pod. So I've watched a little bit of the highlights. Mate, take your opportunity. And he's taking his opportunity. Gloucester have still got some good players. You've got Joe Simpson, Ed Slater, huge fan of his. You think of like the Matt Garvey, you think of Lewis Ludlow in the second row. Sorry, think of Lewis Ludlow in the back row as well, who's El Capitano. Didn't play. You know, yeah, I know he didn't play, no. He's, um, but I'm talking about the squad in general. Yeah. But yeah, I talk about the squad, maybe, maybe mention Banahan, that might take away into that. Uh, so you look at Lewis Ludlow's captain, no, he didn't play. Woodward at fullback, and then the guys that are away with international duty, Paledri. Who else have we got? Jack Singleton's a good signer from as well at Hooker. Mm. Yeah, Singleton. Obviously, Lewis Reed Samet. How good is he, by the way, on the wing? Not just speed wise. What someone said it in comms, and actually thought it was the same before they said it. He ain't just quick. He's physical around the breakdown, kick chase, all them things. So they've got some quality players. So I mean, apologise to any Gloucester fan and Martin St. Quinton, the owner, if they genuinely thought that I was genuinely being serious about relegation. I'm not. All I'm saying is, is pray yeah, for Quinn. I'm just saying pray, pray for Quinn. <laughs> yeah, mate, you're backtracking. What I'll do is I will be very honest. Gloucester were way better on the day above Wasps. Wasps were pretty bang average, to be honest. And Gloucester fully deserved their victory. The big question is, and it's what we spoke about last week, there's be some surprise results, but just consistency. So Gloucester need consistency in their performance week to week. And that's why it's frustrating. That's why Jim said they, were, they could get relegated. And Quinn's, Quinn's dismantled. How? Dismantled. Danny Kerr played very well. Marcus Smith played very well. Dismantled Saints. Saints have lost eight games on the spin now at home in the Premiership in 2020. What a stat that is. You've lost eight games on the spin, Saints. And we were talking them up. Sam Vesti, just start picking your nose and eating it on TV again because they were the good times. What's happening there? Well, some people are worried about um, Newcastle, but they've gone two from two, lads. How? But I'll tell you how. They struggled against the Ealing Trailblazers in pre-season. Tell me how, Andrew. <laughs> Tell me how. Well, they, play, they played well last week and they were very accurate against Bath down at the wreck. But, my God, that game on Friday night against Sale. Sale we Classic. Took, took Classic. Four. Us up there with one of the worst games I've ever seen in my life. I turned it off after 20 minutes. I thought, I am not spending Friday night watching this. So, what did you do? I put on something on Netflix called... Up Shit's Creek or something. It's hilarious if you've not watched it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Newcastle, fair play though. Toby Flood scored a try at the death. 
and everyone's going on about Toby Flood doing it. It was all Mickey Young's kick. What a nudge for Mickey Young. He's had his head on Mickey Young as well for, for people out there, but it's still going very thin, so he needs to get on the Suns as well. Um, but yeah, Newcastle, two from two. Everyone thought they were going to be potentially the whipping boys, but they're not. They're here to play. So good on the Falcons. One of my old clubs doing exceptionally well. What do you guys make of London Irish's new home? And they went over this, sir. Mate, it was box kick, missed touch, penalty, missed touch. I mean... It the, was... thing is, the, the thing is, well, when you listen to the games as well, and you don't want to go too hard on them because everyone's doing their best, right? And it just underlines, it. in my opinion, IMO is to do with fans. It's to do with the atmosphere and the build-up and everything that comes with it for the players. It must be really difficult because what we're watching is almost like a training run. It's training run games. I'm telling you now, that is what we're seeing. That is yeah. exactly how it's playing out. So you don't want to... You know, you speak too badly of it because there's a lot of money going into these games. BT Sport, obviously Amazon have invested a lot as well. The commentators, you know, they're saying the same things and it's difficult for them. I'm, I'm commentating this evening on hashtag always Edinburgh against Ulster. You know, we've got to make the best of the situation that we find ourselves in and without bloody labouring the point, bring on the summer is all I'm saying because when this Lions tour goes, goes ahead, people are going to be going absolutely mental. Mate, do you reckon the Lions tour is going to go ahead still? Yes. Do you think? I reckon it will be behind closed doors. No, you don't. Do- I do. I do. I do not what. bring the tone of this day I down. No, I do hope not. it's not. I desperately hope it's not. But I'm te- if There's not a chance. That it'll be like, well, let's just play on Christmas Day. It ain't going, going ahead with no fans. I'm not having it. I'm telling you now, I will put a stop to it. I've got the power to do so. You do that, James. So I hope I hope you can, and I hope that fans are allowed there because it'll be amazing. What makes you think it's going to be behind closed doors, Goody? China, it's fucking, mate. It's a fucking pandemic going on around the world. <laughs> we're, we're in lockdown still, without Andy being Rowe, in Andy Rowe months. is in denial because he's a Kiwi and everything's back to normal on the different planet that is down in New Zealand. Could have sworn there's some vaccines out there. Well, we'll get onto your feature in just a minute, Jim. But uh, Budgie Smuggler on board with us again this week, so keep your weirder than weird fish stories coming in on social media to be in with a chance to win a pair of limited edition rugby pod budgies. Do you guys see the Pumas and the All Blacks at Budgie Smuggler HQ in Australia picking up their stash last week? I did. I did. And, and the, the Argentinians had their budgies pulled down, didn't they? I actually saw a few really? pairs during the game. Saw a pink pair and saw a pineapple pair. And let's just say that Pablo Matera was wearing ours. He was. I saw him. Well, Budgie have got you covered this Christmas. There's a solid selection of rugby smugglers available online from teams like Fiji and Northampton Saints. There's exclusive player pairs from England's Jack Knoll, Alice Skenger's Baby Rhino Foundation, and there's a pair especially designed for all the bingers out there as well. There's loads more in their range for men, women, and kids. So give the gift of smuggling this Christmas. Just visit budgiesmuggleruk.com and use the code podpodpod to get free delivery for the next day. Right, it's time for Jim will solve it now. What do you guys make of uh, oh, Jim? What do you make of Freddie's effort a couple of weeks ago? I was driving in the car at a lowish point, made me laugh, and no word of a lie, hand on heart, crossed my heart. I got it straight away, even before Bollocks. Freddie. I, Bollocks. The, the the legs in the room, like it was just too easy to get. So mate, mate, he did well. He did well. It's under pressure. Let's see if we can get it today because it's back. The riddle's back. We don't know how long for. It could be one week only. One week only. One week only. But this is it. Riddle me this, lads. Riddle me that, Carol. Jim will solve it. I am white when I'm dirty. I am black when I'm clean. What am I? This is so much harder than Freddy's. Because it's short, so it's there's not nothing, right. you can't dig anything out of that. I, a white van. I, I am white when I'm dirty, and black <laughs> when I'm clean. Give me a hint. Old school. Yeah. That's a very good hint, actually. Old, Old school. School. Old school. Oh. Uh, Blackboard. Yeah. Go on, that. He's got it! Oh, oh, I've got it! it. <laughs> there there yes. you go. Hey, when you're clever, it just takes all the momentum out of it, doesn't it? Because it's just too easy. That's what Freddie did. And I've just done what Freddie did. But 
It's not Freddie's segment. It was a quick one, lads. I am white when I'm dirty and I'm black when I'm clean. What am I? You're a blackboard. <laughs> Riddle me this, lads. Riddle me that, Freddie. Carol, wherever you are. I just solved it. <laughs> right, let's first things off with the good, the bad, and the ugly, and Suns up on board again this week, aren't they, Goody? Yes, they are. Suns are here, and I reckon Jim's been putting it on his upper lip. That tash is looking great, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm questioning whether to keep it or not, but because my lid and the tash go together, it's just the volume that it brings. And being on a podcast, it's all about volume. So big thank you to Suns. Mentioned it before. Acceptance is number one. And once you've accepted it, the world is your oyster. Merry Christmas, sports fans. Guns is a men's health brand that's helping guys with one of the key issues that they don't often talk about, how to keep their hair. They do this by offering free online consultations with GPs, providing a range of licensed and medically proven products for preventing and treating hair loss and delivering via monthly or three monthly subscription direct to your door. They get results in nine out of 10 men and you can take the consultation in less than two minutes. Results can be seen from three months and the three-month plans are the most cost-effective. So just visit suns.co.uk and use the code RUGBYPOD20 to get 20 quid off your first order. That's S-O-N-S.co.uk, and the code is RUGBYPOD20. So go and check them out and show Hair Loss who's boss. Yeah, loads of good as ever across the world of rugby. Let's start off Andy Rowe. We'll tip the slipper where it's due to be tipped, down in, well, it's Australia, but for New Zealand. Yes. The All Blacks... The All Blacks bounce back, getting their own back on Argentina, spanking them 38 nil at the weekend. Some quality rugby played, and Will Jordan, wow, he was wow, decent. Amazing. Outstanding from him. They don't win the good, though, because there's loads more. We're going to go to Georgia. Well, we're going to go to Ireland, but to Georgia, and Georgia's try. Now, I don't know how the fuck he says his name. <laughs> <laughs> Just call him Willie. <laughs> but Georgie... Kev Zeladze. Kev Zeladze. What I mean, what a ladzi, Kev Zeladze is. He'd be a top lad. Absolute world of a try. Yeah, absolute world of a try from halfway. Skinning a few of the Irish boys and then powering over at death. And then powering over at the end. So, hell of a try from him. Um, what else was good? Let's go back to a bit of Premiership Ruggers. And the extra Chief Chief Chiefs roll on. Pulling Bath Pants down 40 points to three. And on top of that, not only was it an outstanding performance, but when you get chance, people... Have a little look at Tom O'Flaherty's try. Crossfield kick from Simmons, catches it on the bottom. Crossfield kick from Simmons, hoofs it on the volley, then shows the gas, hell of a try. Very reminiscent of a try that I was involved in many years ago at Old Trafford, where I put a crossfield kick into Mark Cueto. Mark Cueto hoofs it on on the volley, gets taken out. Dylan Armitage wins the race and then skids with his head. He gets a big graze all the way down the side of his face. But Tom O'Flaherty, Tom O'Flaherty, what a try. Uh, have a look at that. That was good. Um, we'll stay in the Premiership and we'll mention James's old team, Gloucester. They beat Wasps 40 points to 24. And I'm hum- I am humble enough to say that Gloucester were outstanding and Wasps were bad. So congratulations to Gloucester. You get a mention of the good, but you don't win it. Lloyd Evans bossed things at 10. No sips, no problem. Just keep Lloyd Evans at 10, boys. There's your answer. Uh, what else was good? Uh, Harlequins, James. We're going to put them in the good this weekend. They bounce back, pulling Northampton Saints pants down 49-29 at home. Hell of a performance. Jim, you were delighted by that, aren't you? Did the lads do media the week leading up to it? I don't, think, I don't think they did, no. no. <laughs> there we go. So, hell of a performance by Quins. Their bounce back ability was strong. They get a mention in the good. They don't win it, though. We're going to go back to international rugby and the Autumn Nations Cup. We're going to go back to Ireland. Billy Burns, we mentioned him earlier, scored his first try for Ireland on his first start for Ireland. Uh, he was the only real bright spark for me, so outstanding from him. But sticking with international rugby, the good this week can only go to one man. A gentleman that has refereed his 100th test match. Nigel Owens, absolute legend of the game. He gets the good this week. Anyone that can get... Anyone that's racked up a century of tests, whether it be as a referee or a player, deserves one hell of a shout. So, Nigel Owens, you get the good this week. The bad, plenty of bad, to be honest, loads of bad. I'm starting with Italy. They lost to France's fourth team and got their pants pulled down by France's fourth team as well. They were right, they were right first 20. They were right for the first 20 minutes, so yeah. So, back to the drawing board for Italy, pretty poor from them. Uh, Montpellier will go to France. We always like to put something French in the bad. Uh, Montpellier lost at home again 
in the top 14. This time to Bordeaux. Um, not going so well for a friend of the show, Philippe Saint-André. He'll be back on here soon. <laughs> <laughs> he can tell us all about it. <laughs> Are you suggesting he's getting sacked, Jim? You're probably. Horrible. Well, that's what they do in France. Don't so be horrible. Probably. Don't be horrible. And sticking in France as well, Cast had their pants pulled down at home by Claremont, 40 points to 14. That was pretty bad. Um, Saints, we mentioned it earlier, got absolutely bullied by Harlequins at home. That's their eighth defeat on the spin. An absolute hide him. Things aren't right at Saints. Sam Vesti, start picking nose and eating it again. And Phil Dowson, the defence coach, just do some work, mate, because defence is shocking. Um, what else is bad? Uh, Sam James. Did you see the lid on Sam James? No. I mean, we've talked about it. Let, let, let me guess. A lot of hair on top, not a lot on the side. No, no. What? Opposite. He, he's gone for the mullet look, but he's upgraded the mullet. You know what? Like you dip sheep to get rid of lice and things like that. No, I didn't know that, no. Well, that's what you do. Anyway, he looks like he's been dipped. So he's had the bottom inch of his mullet dyed blonde. And he's got brown oh, hair. Oh, he's gone for the skunk. The skunk, he's gone for the skunk, yeah. So he has got a mullet that's been skunked and he's got some of it dyed at the back. So a pretty shocking lid. Um, hopefully it's for charity though, because last time we took the mick out of someone's hair was Donkey Weir. And that was for charity. Acorns, great charity. So hopefully, Sam James, you're doing that for charity because you look ridiculous. Uh, the bad this week, though, unfortunately, you can only go to one gentleman. And we've mentioned him quite a few times on this podcast. Is he French? He may well be French, James. <laughs> he may well say, no, 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 no. <laughs> Roland <Rebel Poir, laughs> an absolute shock at the weekend. <laughs> an absolute shock at the weekend. Didn't listen to his TMO when his TMO was buzzing in to say there's a tackle in the air. No, 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 damn bigger, he jumped it into him. Uh, so, Roman Poit, you get the bad this week. Uh, and the ugly. The only one ugly thing I could find, really. Um, and it comes from your neck of the woods, Andy Rowe, obviously. Oh. And the All Blacks replacement, Tyrell Lomax. What a name. What a name Tyrell Lomax is. But mm. what is that ugly? What, is that his name? No, he's got a great name. Oh, I oh. thought you said his name was ugly. I quite liked it. No, I'm saying Did what you? a name. Unbelievable name, but what a what's Judas. Happened? What, what's what a, happened? Shoulder, forearm smash to the face of Sordoni, the Argentinian. Should have been a red. It's a straight red all day long, Andy Rowe. What did Pablo say about it, though? What did Pablo do about it? He no respect. Pablo Matera said he no respect. I, I follow you, Pablo. Yeah, I don't think Pablo could breathe at that point because they were getting absolutely pumped. So, uh, yeah, but it wasn't a great look. Uh, Tyrell Lomax, who should get a decent enough ban. And he gets the ugly this week. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Jim. And thank you all for listening. And don't forget to hit subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. Leave us a review and check us out on YouTube as well. Rugby pod. Pod, pod, pod.